Oh, here we go. Good evening and welcome to the fastest half hour of the cryptid world. This week in Bigfoot, the news show that scours the internet and the Bigfoot community each and every week to bring you the people, places, and stories making headlines around the Bigfoot world. Then we take it and wrap it up in a nice, neat 30-minute package. If it has to do with Sasquatch, Bigfoot of the Wild Man, you know, we've got you covered. Here's what we got in store for this week. We'll take a look at how the U.S. kept secret tabs on UFOs and Yeti hunting in Nepal. Mike Lucci heads down under for a look into the latest Yowie trail cam photo. Snowwalker's got a bone to pick with MK Davis over Patty's ongoing enhancements in the latest two minutes with, and Bigfoot comes knocking on a motorhome in the Pacific Northwest. These stories and much more, so grab a drink, settle in, and if we move too fast, just hold on, everything's gonna be okay. Well, let's go. We lead off this week with a glimpse into the past and how modern science continues to unravel ancient genetic data and how locating Bigfoot's fossilized remains could rewrite human history. Deep within the vast expanses of the Mojave, Sonoran, or Great Basin deserts, or quite possibly the Arctic tundra, a tantalizing possibility lingers, the discovery of Bigfoot's fossilized remains. This possibility raises not only questions about proving to science the existence of the elusive creature, but also intriguing connections between Bigfoot and mankind's evolutionary history. While the thought of uncovering Bigfoot's remains might seem a far-off dream, recent breakthroughs in paleoanthropology have showcased the remarkable potential fossilized proteins in reshaping our understanding of ancient human relatives. The world of paleoanthropology was rocked when researchers successfully extracted genetic information from ancient human relatives, shattering the boundaries of our genetic record. In a groundbreaking study led by Enrico Capanelli from the University of Copenhagen, you know, the same institution leading the charge in eDNA collection with the lovely Christine Bauman, a new frontier was forged using mass spectrometry to analyze protein sequences within the enamel of tooth fossils. These fossils found in the South African cave date back to approximately 2 million years, offering a window into the distant past
As the line between myth and reality blurs, only one certain thing remains. Our journey of discovery is far from over, and the secrets of our ancient past continue to call us forward. In this field, you'll find people claiming all sorts of things or signs of Bigfoot. But one of the most bizarre are those upside-down trees you sometimes see photos of that appear to have been uprooted and shoved back into the ground. This phenomenon has been reported across North America, with most coming out of the Pacific Northwest. Researchers think these purported totems could represent anything from territorial indicators or travel markers, like those stick structures, to potential warning signs. A more contentious aspect of these uprooted trees puts a Squatch's physical capabilities into question. And researchers will argue, if something like a gorilla can reportedly throw and lift thousands of pounds, then something of a Squatch's stature should be immensely stronger. Some people cite Thinker Thunker's Bigfoot Throwing a Tree video as an example of its purported strength. And if that's the case, then yeah, I guess a Squatch, for whatever reason, would probably be capable of putting an upside-down tree into the ground. So while there's an argument that Squatches could be flipping over trees in the woods, there are some natural and man-made possibilities we also have to consider, especially if we're going to be looking at this through a critical thinking lens. Uh, for example, it's hard to rule out landslides or floods whose conditions are most likely capable of uprooting and flipping a tree, without any harm in intervention at least. This could also account for the ones allegedly found in remote areas, which is why many believers says it rules out loggers. But loggers, who do have the equipment to physically uproot, flip, and reinsert a tree into the ground, and even in doing it, can still access and log these remote areas via helicopters. As you can see, this Facebook comment I found, which comes from a blue checkmark verified logger, serves as a first-hand source in the logging industry. In fact, a disgruntled logger uprooting trees inadvertently created the centerpiece of what is now the Glacial Gardens in Mendenhall Valley, Alaska. One interesting possibility I came across is that these upside-down trees could be part of a forgotten indigenous ritual. The upside-down tree is a prominent symbol in Hinduism, known as the inverted tree of life. Even in Christianity during the Middle Ages, upside-down Christmas trees were supposed to represent the Holy Trinity. Perhaps the greatest example of this is something called Seahenge, a prehistoric monument in Norfolk County, England, that was believed to have been a burial or worship site. Now, we could probably do a whole deep dive on this, so I'm glad we at least touched on some of the main points and uh, potential causes behind this anomaly and um, talk about why it could or couldn't be Sasquatch related. It's hard to say what's truly behind this wilderness oddity, and while I'm sure we'd all love the sole cause to be our towering hominid friends, if we're going to do this diligently, it's important to evaluate and rule out any other possibilities in our pursuit of the truth. On March 25, 1968, over the skies of western Nepal, a strange event unfolded. A blazing object with flashes of light and a thunderous sound disintegrated over the Kaski region, leaving witnesses stunned. This event didn't escape the Central Intelligence Agency, which marked it as a UFO in a report dated June 13, 1974. The report's mystery deepened with the discovery of a large metallic disc in a crater near Pukhari. However, this wasn't the only rendezvous with the strange for the CIA in this part of the world. Throughout February and March of 1968, the agency documented sightings of UFOs in Latka, Timpu, Sikkim, and eastern Nepal, totaling seven sightings in all. These sightings emerged from the CIA's declassified archives from 2017, woven into a tapestry of Cold War geopolitics and Nepal's geopolitical significance. The question inevitably arises, could these UFO sightings be more than they seem? Could they be the clandestine tests of cutting-edge surveillance aircraft by various nations? After all, the CIA faked UFO reports due to their secretive, high-altitude U-2 reconnaissance aircraft trials. Parallel to this mystery lies the captivating chronicle of the Yeti, the Himalayan counterpart of Bigfoot. The year 1959 witnessed the American embassy in Kathmandu disseminating a memo outlining expedition regulations targeting the elusive Yeti. 
Strategically timed, this memo coincides with the era when Western adventurers embarked on quests to uncover the Yeti's secrets amidst the mountains. Enter Peter Byrne, a character deeply associated with the pursuit of the elusive Yeti. Byrne, who passed away a few weeks ago at the age of 97, led a life of adventure, from his time in the Royal Air Force during World War II to becoming a renowned big game hunter in India and Nepal. His journey eventually led him to the United States, particularly the Pacific Northwest, where he rose to prominence as a prominent figure in the quest for Bigfoot. Byrne's Bigfoot pursuits, although never bearing fruit, encapsulated an era where he ran expeditions, attracted press attention, and became a central figure in the public's imagination and fascination with the unknown. Curiously, the origin story of Byrne's involvement in the search for the Yeti weaves back to the CIA's activities in the late 1950s in Tibet. Following the conquest of Mount Everest in 1953, stories of a mysterious bipedal creature known as the Yeti began circulating. This phenomenon resonated across continents, echoing in the Pacific Northwest with sightings of the similar creature called Bigfoot. The convergence of these narratives captured the attention of Tom Slick Jr., an adventurous American heir to an oil fortune. Slick became a patron of Burns' Himalayan expeditions, fueling their pursuits into the mountains in search of the evidence of Yeti's existence. Although footprints and eyewitness accounts emerged, concrete evidence remained elusive. The apex of Burns' quest was an alleged Yeti finger, part of a hand secured by a Buddhist monastery in Nepal. Burns' audacious act of spiriting the finger for study illustrates the depth of his dedication in solving the Yeti mystery. DNA testing later proved the finger to be human, yet the allure of the unknown persisted. Amid the mystery, the shadow of the CIA's involvement looms large. A plausible case can be made that Tom Slick Jr.'s Yeti investigation overlapped with the CIA's clandestine activities in the Himalayas during the height of the Cold War. And while no conclusive evidence exists due to the CIA's tendency to redact documents, intriguing whispers suggest a connection, adding another layer to the puzzle. And as we reflect back on the saga of the Yeti and Bigfoot, symbols of the unknown that have captivated human imagination for generations were reminded of the allure of secrets and the unexplored. The truth behind these enigmas, much like the UFO sightings, remains just out of reach. The documents hint at a world painted in shadows, a world where even the most ingenious minds are left pondering. Until the veil of the mystery is lifted, we're left with tales of adventures, legends, and clandestine pursuits, and the journey of unraveling the strange and unusual world lying all around us. When exactly the first modern humans arrived in North America is a highly disputed topic, with estimates from 10,000 to 100,000 plus years and everything in between being proposed. The most widely accepted way modern humans first reached North America was a land bridge via the Bering Strait. But that's just modern humans, who've only been around for about two to 300,000 years. The first hominids with bipedal capabilities appeared at least 4 million years ago, with evidence showing they were in East Asia at least 2.1 million years ago. This timeline overlaps with the start of what's known as the Quaternary Ice Age, a continuous ice age that we're currently in, kept alive by the existence of at least one permanent ice sheet. Scientists believe this ice age has seen up to 50 glacial and interglacial cycles, with some lasting tens of thousands of years. The shifting glacial plains cause fluctuating sea levels, creating intermittent time spans where the aforementioned Bering Land Bridge connected Eurasia and North America. For context, this simulation shows the glacial cycles during that period over the last 120,000 years, and shows three main instances when a clear-cut route from Russia into North America existed. The first reportedly occurred around 70 to 92,000 years ago, the second one between 30 and 60,000 years ago, while the most recent happened around 10 to 30,000 years ago, which is when modern humans were supposed to have first arrived in North America. Now, that simulation just covers a small percentage of the entire 2.5 million year Quaternary Ice Age, which may have created numerous accessible travel routes for pre-modern hominids over the years. We also know what we know about our prehistoric ancestors from old bones, artifacts, and settlements that were discovered the latter two of which ancient hominids may or may not have uh, been able to create, limiting how much trace evidence they leave behind. Now, it's pure speculation, but based on these factors, it's very much possible that Squatches, or one of their ancestors, could have reached and set up shop in North America long before the first modern humans.
Remember, it's estimated that over 98% of human history is unrecorded, so we know a lot less about our ancient past than we realize. And considering how science is always disproving itself, what we think is currently fact might be proven otherwise, throwing us another curveball in this enigmatic puzzle. Are you ready to uncover the mysteries of Bigfoot? Join us for SquatchCon Idaho 2023. This year, we're bringing the magic directly to your screen or join us in person. Witness the world premiere of the enhanced Paul Freeman Bigfoot footage. Doug Hycheck discovered a secret within this enhanced video you'll have to see to believe. Hear from an all-star panel of Bigfoot experts like Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum, Cliff Barockman, Brian King Sharp, and Michael Freeman. Get exclusive online bonuses such as Bigfoot-themed wallpapers, a Bigfoot coloring book, an interactive Bigfoot quiz, a Squatch Nut Field Guide, and more. Whether you attend in person or watch it live online, you'll be part of an unforgettable experience. Don't miss out on this unique opportunity. Secure your spot today. Squatch Con Idaho 2023. Step into the unknown. Well, it's that time again, folks. We are now officially halfway through the episode, which means it's the part of the show where we give content creator Michael Merchant, a.k.a. Snowwalker Prime, screen time to speak his mind and get what's ever bothering him off his chest. God, he's awful good at this. This is Two Minutes With. Dog man and a vampire walk into a bar. Bartender says, what is this, a joke? Remember the picture of Patty with the eyelashes? The one that was pulled from the 1967 16 millimeter film and enhanced by AI. Yeah, he's, he's released on that photograph. Now you can see Patty's teeth. Her teeth and her eyelashes. You do realize that that's fake information. That's AI generated. It just, it's made up. It's not real data. Nope, not so. He claimed it was not enhanced by AI. Stacy's mom has got it going on. They didn't use AI. Well, what do you mean, they? Well, the, the guy, uh, MK Davis, he didn't actually do the enhancement. Who, who did? He was a cop and good at his job, but he committed the ultimate sin and testified against other cops gone bad. Cops that tried to kill him, but got the woman he loved instead. His friend of his did it and then sent it to him, but but he, he told him he didn't use AI. So what did he use? Nobody knows. Nobody knows how this was done. Well, the guy, the guy doing it, but he hasn't divulged his proprietary technique. So he's using AI. No, no, no. He was told it. MK says it's just, it's just tightened up. It's not, it's not enhanced, it's just, just the image has been tightened up. Tightened up? Yep, tightened up so you can see the eyelashes and the teeth. What the bloody hell does that mean? Nobody knows. It's AI enhanced. It's AI enhanced! No, tightened up, it's tightened up. You're not listening to what I'm saying to you. The truth is that MK does not know how this was done because the guy hasn't told anybody. You know, once in a while, you and I are on the same page exactly. It's been tightened up. Yay, Bigfoot. Who said that? Your hair looks awesome. Where are those voices coming from? Love your hat. You have nice teeth. Footage taken with a 16 millimeter film camera from 1967 doesn't have the resolution to show the freaking eyelashes and the teeth. That's why it had to be tightened up. I don't care how much tightening up you do without taking AI and, and imagining what it looked like, you're not gonna get that data. It's made up data. Have you been watching your caffeine intake? You, you seem a little uppity. I'm uppity because you keep presenting this information incorrectly. Look, I don't want to fight with you. I just want you to admit how pretty it is. Yes, it's very pretty. They did a beautiful job. You can see the eyelashes and the teeth. The teeth are made up. The teeth are not in the original photo. They've been AI generated. It's tightened up. It's been tightened up, I tell you. Alive, alive, alive. It's 
been enhanced. Tightened up. Enhanced. Tightened up. Enhanced. It's been enhanced by AI technology. It's clear to anybody. You need to learn to breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth. I mean, the eyelashes were amazing, but now you can see the teeth. The teeth. The original footage doesn't support the resolution to capture those details. That's why it was tightened up. The details aren't there. The information's not there. The data is not there. It's impossible. New material is made up. You just keep saying the same stuff over and over. Look, if you were to take a magnifying glass, put it under a microscope, you're not gonna see those details. They're not there in the original footage. It's too blurry, it's too shaky, the resolution's too low. Agree to disagree. A Washington state woman claims that her motorhome was attacked by a Bigfoot and that the creature returns regularly to vandalize her property if she forgets to leave the apples outside. Tanya Carlos, 71 from Roy, Washington, owns property in the shadow of Mount Rainier, a Bigfoot hotspot near the Nisqually Indian community. Talking to the Bigfoot Believers Facebook group, Tanya explained that her first encounter came with the Bigfoot a few years back as she was unloading a crate of apples she had bought for her horses from her car. According to Carlo, the apples were left outside on the ground as she went into her motorhome with shopping bags. It was then that she noticed her dog Jiggy began barking outside, jumping up against the RV's door, trying to get in. Tanya let her dog in, looking up to see a big, hairy, human-like reddish-brown creature much larger than the bears in the area, squatting down and taking apples out of the crate she had left outside. We just froze looking at each other as I am old and a bit incontinent, I peed a bit, Tanya stated. When the creature finally stood up, Carlo estimated that its height was roughly eight feet tall. Dropping the apples as it stood, Tanya went on to say that she started talking to the creature like she would her dog in an attempt to calm it down. She then jumped inside the motorhome and peered out the window, only to see the Bigfoot heading towards the door of the motorhome. Unfortunately for her and for us, Carlo says she left her cell phone in her car charging at the time, so no video or pictures of the incident. It was then that the creature first attacked her RV. In her post on Facebook, Tanya wrote, while well, the big fella placed his big hand against the door window, pressing it so hard that it stripped the screws, cracking the plastic trim inward until only the bottom edge was connected. It peeled the bottom corner clear up to the back roof line. The generator broke loose and was lying on the ground. Tana did share a few photos of the damage she says was caused that day by the creature, so take a look. She also shared this image she said the creature left with this footprint. After what must have been a harrowing experience that day, if it did indeed happen the way she says, Tana now leaves apples outside in a bid to keep the peace and to get the creatures to leave her alone. Now in a larger RV, Tana still gets occasional wax on the wall from time to time if she forgets to leave apples outside. Carlo also states that her neighbor Jane feeds the creatures as well, and that her friend DJ has more than one Bigfoot on his 300-acre farm. Offering advice to those who follow her online, Tana says to anyone else facing Bigfoot-related problems, if you feel threatened, just give them the space and the courtesy to let things settle. Just remember, don't threaten them as they seem to sense your intentions. If you have any encounters like Tanya's that you'd like us to cover on This Week in Bigfoot, email the show at this week in Bigfoot newscast at gmail.com. Hey, this is Chuck Larson. You're watching the CARC channel on YouTube. After making its first appearance in episode six, the Yowie is officially back on This Week in Bigfoot. I first stumbled across this image on the Paranormal Roundtable Facebook group. Incidentally, on the same day, our last episode premiered. Go figure. Well, the photos come from a group called Yowie X, Australian Yowie Sightings and Yowie Encounters, which was originally posted on August 12th. The photos poster said it was caught by an automatic camera that reportedly took pictures every 20 seconds and claimed it was allegedly taken around somewhere where Queensland and New South Wales meet. One individual named David Taylor claimed the image came from his Facebook group called Sunshine Coast Yaoi Research and that it was allegedly a fake. This comment drew my eye to the watermark in the picture's lower left-hand corner, which literally reads that exact name. So I did some digging on the Sunshine Coast group page and lo and behold, look what I found. 
It was originally posted on January 4th, 2018, and was accompanied by these two other photos. Now, this is just one opinion, but those two other images sort of look like they were taken from a moving car. And it's hard to say if all three were even taken at the same location or time. Even when it was first posted, commenters were quick to point out how the figures looked to be in the same posture when these uh, pictures were taken, while a few even claimed these images are fake and originally came from US-based outlets. And contrary to what the Yowie X post said, in the original one, incidentally clarified by the same David Taylor we mentioned earlier, the Sunshine Coast group confirmed they knew nothing about who, where, or when these pictures were taken. Some people in the Yowie X group posted Bigfoot cutouts to compare with the figure. It's kind of hit or miss with the first picture, the original one we were looking at. However, with these two new images brought to light, there does seem to be a strong resemblance between the figures in question and the Bigfoot cutouts, but that's just one opinion. Tracking down those photos' origins was a real doozy with lots of twists and turns, between its checkered backstory and eerily suspicious resemblance to those Bigfoot cutouts. I think we've got plenty to work with here for you to decide if these purported photos are fact or hoax. It's time to bring you up to speed on a couple of recent Bigfoot podcasts and live streams. First in the box, Mountain Beast Mysteries. And the channel's latest upload, Justin talks about the U.S. government's cover-up of UFOs and alien technology. Check it out. The technology is, is actually revealed if we found out what it actually is, which is a source of energy, of clean energy, um, unlimited clean energy that could power the world, basically. It could provide the entire world with free energy. It would make pretty much every industry that these elites control, like oil and gas, it would make the whole industry obsolete and they would lose control. So they're desperately trying to control this narrative now. I bet you these people are shaking in their boots because these UFO craft, the, the genuine UFO craft are here and they keep showing themselves. And I, I believe that the government not like the regular level of government that we see with like the president and whatnot, but like I'm talking above that, like the deep state, this shadow government, they are probably shaking in their boots and they are forced to come out and have a hearing like this so that they can jump on it and control the narrative before everything is revealed. More and more people are experiencing UFO phenomena. And if it is revealed that there is a way to, you know, give people free energy around the world, to change the world for the better, to get rid of oil and gas, to get rid of that level of control that they have over us. What, what do they have? They lose everything. Next up, it's the Bigfoot Influencers on Untold Radio AM, episode 43. Here, Dana and Tim have a compelling conversation with longtime Bigfoot researchers and friends Kyle Gibson and Mantra Withers. Check it out. Say, but I'll never forget because when my lights of the truck hit hit one of them its arm was up like this and you could see a, you could see this this wispy hair just you see the arm come up and when my lights hit it you could just see this thin wispy hair just just blowing in the wind kind of you know mm -hmm. similar to what mantra you saw when yeah. you know, when you were 12. yeah just burned it burned it into my memory and just like wow you know and my friend he didn't know what to think you know we we never even really and here's another thing we didn't really talk about it because we didn't want people to think we we're there was something wrong with us you know we're just kind of me and my buddy's like remember that time down there in the yakima you know that kind of thing you know yeah. did you still go fishing after you saw that um i don't fish down there anymore but me and no, Montre, I mean that night after you saw them did you turn the truck around or did you guys keep going no we went home batting cleanup this week is none other than Snowwalker prime in this video from mike's trip to belize he interviews a jaguar hunter as he tells of a rare Bigfoot encounter in the jungles of Central America. Check it out. And we went to that spot. I didn't see no truck. But the mule smelled that stuff that passed him. Mm. Did you smell it or just the mule? Just the mule. I didn't, I did, did, I did, I wasn't afraid. I didn't feel anything. Mm. I saw it. I didn't feel nothing, but the mule saw. Maybe it was right there and I didn't see it. So you were in the thick jungle going on a trail and this thing just crossed the trail just and never looked the down at you? He never looked towards me. He looked straight across the trail. Uh, 
How tall do you think the creature uh, was? He was tall. He was a tall guy. But you can see his feather. You can see it. I don't know if it's hair or what, but you can see when the breeze blows, you, you can see moving like this. So it could have been fur, but the wind was moving it? Yes. What color was it? It was dark black. All black? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it was a man. It's a man. You can see he's walking just like a man. Mm. As the summer of 2023 slowly begins to fade to the distance, there's still only one guy we can all turn to to keep us up to speed on the who's, the what's, and the where's, and that's Chuck Larson with another great show in this week's Spotlight. <laughs> Sierra Bigfoot Music Festival, August 25th through 27th, Quay Hart, California. Conference Spotlight. For this week's Spotlight, we're headed to Aparosan Park in Twain Hart, California for the third annual Sierra Bigfoot Music Festival, presented by Mountain Meadow Production Company. The first band for this three-day festival starts at 12 p.m. Friday, August 25th, and the last band ends at 9 p.m. Sunday, August 27th. You can buy tickets at eventbrite.com, $20 per day or $50 for the whole weekend. Children under 12 are free with an accompanying adult, or you can buy the tickets at the gate, $30 per day or $60 for the weekend. This event will have music, arts, and festivities. Besides the 24 plus bands and singer songwriters, this festival will have live artists and 50 plus artisan makers and vendors. From hot food booths, food trucks and trailers, to cold artisan beverages, bakers and candy makers, this event will have it all. Bring the whole family. There will be a kids music and art zone, as well as face painting, hula hoopers, fire performers, free yoga classes, and belly dancers plus special appearances all throughout the weekend. There will be a Bigfoot Symposium from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Sunday, August 27th, hosted by Sasquatch researcher Jerry Hine. For more information, go to the Festival Facebook page. And that's this week's Conference Spotlight. Brendan, back to you. All right, folks, looks like once again we are all out of time for this week's show. It flies by so fast. I hope you enjoy the new format much faster, much more content. I'd like to thank you for watching and remind you to like and share everything we do here at the Catskill Appalachian Research Collective. And smash that subscribe button. Let us know how you're feeling in the comments section. And if you have any questions or comments, maybe a story for the show, you can also drop us a line at thisweekinbigfootnewscast at gmail.com. So until next week, for Mike Lucci and Chuck Larson, I'm Brendan Brown, reminding you that when it comes to getting your Bigfoot news, be informed, not biased. Take care. <laughs>